song. And uh, now that I know that you know that song, then you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be having you leave it. Because I didn't know that she, that she actually knew it. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? Wonderful song. You are being passed out uh, a copy that I'm going to have you look at tonight that's going to maybe help you as we look a little deeper into Revelation 17 where we're going to be getting into the mystery uh, that I told you last week that we would be uh, trying to deal with. We had dealt with the first six verses last week and when I was speaking to you I actually told you based on verse 7 that when John was being talked to or shown things by the angel that what he had seen that he was in marvel he said wherefore did thou marvel he said I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. I'd like you to notice on the paper that I passed out, I've kind of given the illustration here about the seven heads and ten horns that you see. We have the woman uh, that you remember that had the cup uh, in her hand, uh, which was uh, destruction and contaminated with all the evil in which she had. And also, if you look at the top, I'm giving you a description. When I talk about the beast, I'm talking about Israel's government. When we talk about the woman, we're talking about Israel's leaders, their people, uh, and basically the city. The heads, or the Herods, uh, the seven Herods, and the horns, Ten horns are the Caesars that ruled over Rome. And so when I'm talking about some of these things up here tonight, if you look back on the chart to see exactly what I'm referring to, you'll be able to get a little clearer picture about what it is I'm wanting you to see. As we look at Revelation 17, uh, I had titled it The Mystery, and now we're going to get into where the angel is going to reveal to John a little more so that he's not so amazed about what's going on. You remember that he had shown him all the things that Israel had done since the beginning of time, all the things that she had done basically to God and not keeping his commandment. And when Christ finally came up on the scene, all the things that she had done unto him, and even up to the cross, the blaspheme uh, that he had to endure, the spitting that he had to endure, and all of the ridicule that he had to endure, and we'll be able to see a little bit more tonight, uh, time allows, as to uh, what the angel is basically going to be trying to show uh, John. Basically, we have the mystery solved in the 17th chapter, and it will also, some more details will continue over into the 18th chapter. But the angel is going to basically unravel the mystery of the beast for John. And again, if you look at the paper, when I refer to the beast, you can see exactly who it is that I'm talking about. The terms used in the explanation, basically, that's going to be given, they do not have to be identified because at that time, their language was such in which it was common to John as well as the angel and is also, I think, common to Bible readers. When we think about the term beast, it was understood to be a government which, when it referred to nations and people, and if you turn over to Daniel 7, 17, uh, you can remember that that was explained as it was a king or a kingdom. 
Then we had the term, the bottomless pit. Uh, that was also common, uh, basically, to students of God's Word. But you're going to have to wait to get a little more detail on the bottomless pit until we get to Revelation, the 20th chapter and verse 3, when I will say more concerning the bottomless pit. So kind of a question is, and what happened to this government and these people? Now, if you remember, they lived under the law. And they lived under the law of the Old Testament until they became so sinful that you remember that God had them carried away into Babylonian captivity. And he carried them into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. Therefore now, I want you to look, if you would, when it talks about in the passage here, verse 10, uh, basically talk, excuse me, back to verse uh, 8, the last part. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now, Israel was. But when she gets carried off into Babylonian captivity, she is not. She's not anymore. Because before, when they took her out, what did they do to her, to where she was? Her temple was torn down. Her cities were, bar were burned. And it says here that her people were killed and thousands were taken into a far country to be slaves of other nations. <clears throat> now, as you do look with me in verse 11, it says, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Therefore, the beast that was, as I just spoke, is not. Any other nation of people, any other nation of people or government, would have perished and been no more, but not Israel. Because 70 years later, what does she wind up doing? She winds up returning. The temple is rebuilt. She sets up her religious ordinances <clears throat> after the commandment that were given to them at Horeb. So the beast that was, he is not, yet he is. Now, he had been a government, basically, with three heads. You see, they were a kingdom of priests, according to Exodus, the 19th chapter and verse 6. And God spake to them through the prophets, Hebrews 11 and 1. So they were governed by one prophet, two priests, and three kings. The beast that was carried into captivity and is not received a deadly wound to his head. And those kings were no more. No more kings. Therefore, they had to wait until the line, the tribe of Judah, basically the root and the offspring of David, came forth. And we know that that king was Jesus Christ. The nation breached that wound and took on another set of kings. And who were these other set of kings that they took on? They took on the Herods. And these Herods became the heads of state. Well, how many were there? Well, there were seven of them. On the screen, I've listed them for you. Herod the Great, Archelaus, King Antipas, Philip Herod. Another Philip was the son of Herod the Great, and Herod Agrippa the First, and Herod Agrippa the second. So here is a beast that you see here, and you also see a government, and you see her people that was and was not, and yet is. And folks, this has been her history from the very beginning. She's always coming out of death. Always coming out of death. She came out of Egypt. She was there and was going to die there and would never have been anything but death and slaves. But she, but she was saved of death by God Almighty. She came out of the wilderness 
Not all of them, but she still came out of the wilderness. She came out of Babylon. And now she is coming out of another situation that is basically explained to us here in John. This is the beast then that is killed often, but it does not die. In other words, this is Israel's government that is killed often, but just can't seem to ever go away. And even when God burned her with fire and sent her into all nations to basically serve as slaves, she lived. And then for 1,900 years, they are not. But in 1946, what are they again? Here they are, right back. They are indeed are the only nation, and I checked on this, they are the only nation that I could find of people who ever had lived upon the earth that is not, that was, that is not, and yet is again. No other nation was able to do what Israel has been able to do. And so this is the beast who had only two horns. <clears throat> Basically, they're, be they're, they're priests and they're false prophets with two tribes. Now, we talked about this. Who were the two <clears throat> tribes? They were Benjamin and Judah. Judah. And the system of two faiths. The two faiths were the Pharisees and the... Sadducees, and they had taken upon themselves basically to have seven heads of state, and those seven heads of state were the Herods. However, they were under bondage. Who were they under bondage to? They were under bondage to her ten kings. <clears throat> so what do we have here? We have a beast, basically, who had what? Only two horns. We have a beast, a government that was and is not, and yet is again. Seven heads, Herod's. Ten horns, Caesar's. This was a government that we've also talked about that had the whore, that had the great city. It says here that had sinful people of Israel who were saddled <coughs> upon the beast when Christ came to basically redeem them out of death. That's in 2 Corinthians 1, and John 5, 2 Timothy, the first chapter, and also Revelation 1 and 18. And when Christ set up his kingdom, five, now you hear it now? Five of these Herods are Herods. Five of them have already died. The sixth Herod was reigning, and the seventh was to come. At the time the angel is giving all this description here that I'm trying to explain to you of Israel and his government, it explains that she is the whore, an evil city, and what is she doing? She's writing a government with seven heads. She's also in bondage to Rome and her ten kings. <coughs> Therefore, the picture I passed out to you, if you look at it, you can see that we have a whore with a cup filled with abominations being governed by a government with seven heads and ten horns. And they're all right there in that paper for you to see. The truth about Israel is until the crucifixion, until the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, she had denied in every way having any alien and any alliance with Rome. She had refused to even indicate that she had anything to do with Rome whatsoever. You could not find any place where she wanted to have any allegiance to Rome. She refused to let any person worship with her who worked for the Roman government. What did she call them? She called them publicans and classified them with sinners. And she never, according to my scripture here, she never let the Roman government get to her religion until the hour that she wanted Christ put to death. Think about it. She never wanted a thing to do with Rome. Not one thing until she needed Rome to help her get rid of Christ. Then and only then, did she decide to recognize Caesar as king 
And when she did, it was only for an hour because she needed them to accomplish her task. The Romans granted her power to put Christ to death. And it says they made war with the Lamb, although what did the Lamb do? The Lamb overcame them. And then later these seven, ten kings who granted Israel the power to put Christ to death hated her and destroyed her and burned her with fire. That is that history on down the line of what Rome winds up doing to Israel. <coughs> they completed the task of destroying her and hating her. There was no way the angel could have identified a government that is spoken of in this passage of scripture in chapter 17 with its subjects any better than what's done in chapter 17. In fact, Israel and her end is plainly described in Matthew, the 24th chapter, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And basically, to make it plainer, the angel here adds another qualifying phrase, and I want to put this on the screen for you. It says in verse 15, And he said to me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, look at who they are. There are people, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Now there has never been a nation which had held on to people after they left their borders. But not so with Israel. Israel, the government had them to be subjects if they were in their land and if they were out of their land. If they were in another person's land and they were Jewish, they were still under the Jewish law and they were still under the the power of those that were in charge. This was true with Israel. Regardless of where a Jew lived, he was still subject to Israel's laws and her government. And her government went with her people wherever she went. And she had power over them wherever they were. How many times, no matter where you were, if you were a Jew, what did you have to do at least three times a year? It says right here that she must go up to Jerusalem to worship. Didn't have a choice. You had to do that. Israel had subjects by the multitudes in every nation who spoke the language uh, of that nation wherever they lived. And it talks about that in Acts the second chapter, verses 2 through 12. Now turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 17. And let's look at verses 9 through 18. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads, or seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he come, cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is one of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, they shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now the angel, it further describes the beast for John. And it says here in the verse, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. 
The seven heads, verse 9, are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. The angel used the term beast here as the prophets had used it. That is a beast for a king and his kingdom because we get that from Daniel the 7th chapter in verse 17. So we can expect the term when it is used here, the term mountain, the same way. The term mountain is used by the prophets to mean an administration or government. Now there are seven administrations of seven kings upon which the woman reigneth, of which she is setting. <coughs> now notice here that she <coughs> held the reins, she's doing the driving, and the reigning over the kings of the earth in the land of Palestine. Now notice what I'm going to show you here. She did not sit upon the ten horns. Where did she sit? She sat upon the seven heads, which the angel described as being the seven kings. If the seven mountains are seven kings, and five of them have passed or fallen, then it has to stand to reason with what we're reading here that the angel could not have meant a literal mountain. Mountains do not fall or pass, but administrations do. Then how could a mountain be a king? Now I put this up here because this is some uh, uh, talk that's out there uh, among other people who talk about Revelation, and I wanted to put this up here. Uh, there are some that would have us believe the seven mountains or seven literal mountains were wrongly seated. And there are some in Revelation that uh, have their commentaries that they try to say that all of this is wrong. <coughs> the angel is not telling John where Rome is seated. Notice now, he's not telling John where Rome is seated, but where the whore is sitting. Rome is represented by the ten horns. That represents her kings. <coughs> Israel is represented by seven heads. That's her kings the Herods and their mountains, that is their administration of their government. Now notice what you have here. You have an ungodly woman called a whore or a city named Babylon, which is where? In Jerusalem. And what is she doing? She's sitting upon the reign of seven kings and their administration, the Herods. And they are under bondage to the country with ten kings, the Caesars of Rome. Then this woman, this city, this government was and is not and then is again. This is the true story of Jerusalem and her government. In verse 9, if you look at verse 9, it says, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. Verse 10, or the, uh, that, that verse, the ten horns, the kings of Rome, received no power in the religious affairs of Israel until they wanted to put the Son of God to death. Rome gave it to her, but later what does Rome do? Rome hated the woman, hated the whore, hated the city. What did they do? They made her desolate, they made her naked, they ate her flesh, and they burned her with fire. I want you to know that the ten kings of Rome never did this to Rome. Never happened to Rome. They did it to Jerusalem. It was never done to Rome. And God put it to the hearts of the ten kings to do this to fulfill his will because Jesus said the destruction of Jerusalem was the finishing of the fulfillment of the prophets. Matthew 24. Next week, we're going to talk about the great whore because there is a lot that has to do about her sitting in only one place. And next week, we're going to talk about where that one place is and all the things that she did. And I'm going to itemize them for you. And we will finish this and move on into chapter 18 next week. Now, I know this may be a lot for you to grab a hold of, but I don't think that you can see it any differently. 
If you think that this happened to Rome, it couldn't have happened to Rome. This never happened to Rome. She was never left that way. She was never done that way. Only Jerusalem was done the way that the angel is describing to John. As we think about Revelation, just try to remember what it is I've tried to explain to you the whole time since we started. It is and always shall be the revelation of Jesus. It's not the revelation of Rome. It's not the revelation of the United States. It's not the revelation of Europe. It's not the revelation of way down the line, tribulation and tribulation again and all this stuff. It's the revelation revealing Christ. And to reveal Christ, it can only reveal what we have in Scripture and know about him and what he did. And as we get further over to chapter 18 and 19, and especially when we get to 20, you're going to see what he decides to do to that devil and what the end's going to be for him. And you're going to be so happy knowing exactly why you're a Christian. And the way to become a Christian is you have to believe that Jesus is the Christ. <clears throat> And then you believe and you also, by believing, you also repent of your sins. And then you confess that he is the Christ, the Son of the Most High God. And then you allow yourself briefly to be immersed in water. In that water, there is some cleansing power that is done by Christ, in which he completes a, circum a circumcision, in which he cuts away the old part of the old man gives us a new man, a new man with a new spirit, a new spirit called the Holy Spirit that helps to guide us, and helps to lead us, and one day will help us to get into heaven. If you haven't done that yet, you're missing the most important part of your life that you could ever experience, and that's being outside of Christ. You need to be in Christ. If you haven't if you have questions that you don't understand, ask any of the men here. Come and ask me. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Pray earnestly this week to our God. Give him praise and glory like we talked about this morning. Think about the sun that's up in the sky. And don't take it for granted. God put it up there for a reason. And also remember.